Today's reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 through 20. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and all these decrees, and not consider himself better than his brothers, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Okay, that's enough. <clears throat> Gonna get me to coughing. A lady named Dominique Riel in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, suffered seizures violently when she was a young girl. Started at five, her mother found her seizing in her bed. You can imagine that fear. She survived it, of course, and she had others, and she was going to the doctors, to doctors often seeing different specialists, trying to find out what's going on. And finally, about 10 years later, she went under the knife to see if they could remove or do something with the brain, brain surgery, to <clears throat> get her uh, seizures to stop or at least to cease or something. Medications weren't working. And while they were in there, they found out that she had a rare disease, and the only choice the doctors had at that moment was to literally remove half her brain the right hemisphere of her brain they took out. You see a scan of it, it's, uh, it's sad, but it's interesting. Literally half the brain is gone. <clears throat> of course, the doctors told her all she can do now is sit in a chair and maybe wink and smile and wave at a few people. And that's about all she's going to be able to do the rest of her life. Dominique walks with the aid of a service dog. Nice black Labrador because they're the best. He's a bigger, quite a bit bigger. She walks pretty well though. She could probably walk without him pretty fair. She swims even in meets. Not very fast, but she swims. She's starting to use her left arm. As of a few years ago, she's starting to use her left arm <coughs> some. She knows three languages. And she's the president of a company. Now, we used to make the joke that even somebody with half a brain could understand something. And I think I know a few folks that, 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 aren't, that have half a brain that don't do as well as Dominique does. <laughs> Nevertheless, I, I love looking at stuff like that. I love looking at understanding of how much we, more we know about the brain itself now, the mind, and how it can be used. Anybody ever been told to only use 10% of our brain? Have you seen the instrument they measure that with? You know why? Because it doesn't exist. It's ridiculous to say we only use 10% of our brain. They don't have any idea. We can use as much of our brain as we want to. We can learn things, we can understand things, we can expand our minds, we can grow new neurological pathways where things are learning. When we learn, we're stressing the mind. We're learning, we're changing the brain. And that's a good thing. That's why some people don't like to learn anything new. I don't stress my mind out. Learn anything new. Learning something new is a good thing, right? Should be, anyway. And I've prefaced this sermon with that this morning because <clears throat> learning, and as we're learning the Bible and looking at the value of the Bible this past few weeks and looking at this morning about putting our nose to the grindstone, about getting down to the nitty-gritty of the Bible and learning it. Because, and I have heard a bunch of different ways and a bunch of different people to say, well, I've just tried, but I just can't understand the Bible. Uh, well, I'm going to be that mean old school marm of years ago and says, I don't believe it. <laughs> I believe we can. I believe we can. Folks, if I can dig in and learn it, you can. I got about half a brain most of the time anyway. But we can dig in and we can learn these things and those truths are there. Those <clears throat> nuggets of gold, people used to call it. Uh, sometimes there's an entire vein of gold. We just have to keep tracing it down to see where it goes. And think about Miss Dominique 
and the trouble she's gone through before she lost half her brain folks she had a lot of seizures that doesn't do much good to the brain by the way to the body yet we sometimes say well I just can't understand what God has put in front of me well folks I really 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 believe we can so let's look this morning at a few things and then next week I want to finish this out with some <clears throat> maybe a more of a practical side at the Bible and reading and understanding the Bible a little bit because I've always thought it's bad if somebody tells you to do something they don't tell you how to do it I've never thought that was very good teaching so we're going to look at that some next week now we looked at this passage <clears throat> just a moment ago there in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and keep in mind in Deuteronomy we have uh, the giving of the, of the still the law but it's giving to a new generation that's about to come into the land of promise and as they're coming in there, matter of fact, <clears throat> because we seem surprised sometimes when we get over in Samuel that the people are asking for a king. Well, there's no surprise because the verses pr previous to these, God says, when you come into the land of promise that I'm going to give unto you, you're going to ask for a king to be like the nations around us. He's already said it. He's already prophesied it's going to happen. You're going to choose a king of your own brethren, not of someone outside of my covenant, my fellowship. You're going to choose someone that's going to do upright and do God's will. He is not going to take unto him many wives. <clears throat> you see what's going on here? He's not going to accumulate to himself many horses. Solomon, we're looking at you, I'm afraid to say. But here's the thing. If, when he gets through that and starts looking at the passage we just had read for us a moment ago, one thing that the king was supposed to do was write down himself, please. Notice the wording. To copy down the law. I take that to be what we know as the first five books of the Old Testament. Copy down the law. Copy down the Torah. Copy these things down. Why? That he may know how he ought to govern himself and the people. And he should read it on a regular basis. Daily Bible reading. See there, it's right in the Bible. That's what he's supposed to do. And please notice something about that. It was a preventative measure that the king would not think of himself any more highly than he would the people, back in verse 20 of our text. It was a measure there that he wouldn't fall away and fall into the ways of the world. And it was a way that he could guide the people of God. There was a complete focus there. Don't put anything else in the way. There was a guidance there. You're going to listen to what I have to say. And there's, there's a blessing in this, especially through the rest of the book of Deuteronomy, that when you do these things, you're going to be blessed, which leads a few chapters on. You're going to be blessed when you come into the land of promise. You're going to be blessed in all your days. Now, here's that small but huge word, if you do the things that I tell you to do. Now, folks, that is as clear in the Bible and especially under the Old Covenant as anything could ever be. If you do the things I say and listen to the things that are written down, there's a reason why he had them written down. So they could look at them, they could read them, and they could understand them, and there could be no excuse. People are going to make up excuses. But legitimately, there wouldn't be because God said, I made the way for you. I gave you exactly what you need. I've mentioned before, and it's worth mentioning again, that how wonderful and blessed we are in this world that we have the Bible at our fingertips at any given moment now. Really, at any given moment, we have the Bible at our fingertips. And as readily available as we have made it, made, as it has been made to us, be it electronically, be it on paper, be it whatever else it may, computer screen, wherever else it is, we can find it in a moment's notice now. Is it still available in our hearts, though? It doesn't matter how many stacks of Bibles I have, and I have quite a few. It doesn't matter that however many uh, Bibles we have or anything else or apps on our phone or iPads or computers or anywhere else. What really matters is, is it stored in my heart? That I can't look through the Bible, and again, looking in the Old Testament in particular, and understand that that is the the keeping place of God's Word. That's where He's always really wanted it. Yes, He wants it written down. Yes, He wants it copied. Yes, He wants it in different places. But more than anything else, as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, that your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, in verse 11 in particular. Folks, listen. That's where the Bible has to be hid. And that's the, 
the premise we're looking at here in Deuteronomy chapter 17. It's looking ahead to, at this point, a good ways in the future when that king gets there. But he's, here's what he has to do. He's going to be king over my people. But above all things, he's king for me. He is speaking for me. He is living for me. And I often think about this passage in regard to elders and preachers in the Lord's church. Uh, we of all people, everybody should, but especially those who take a leadership role such as that, should open up the book of God on a regular basis and glean. I mean reach in there and glean. And when you get through gleaning, go ahead and pull out the shovel and the pick and do whatever you got to do and start digging. Because it's there for the taking, but it doesn't just fall into our laps. That we have to do those things. And when that king stood up and when he got ready to lead God's people, folks, it was for a just cause and for the right reason. That he could understand God and how the word was given to him. Now here's something about it, though. By the time we look up, not too far down the road... Too far down the road in the Old Testament kingdom, near the end of the southern kingdom, after they split, they split because they didn't know what the book said. They split because they didn't care what the book said anymore. Yet we have here Josiah. Josiah was a king of reformation. He came to the throne at eight years old. Eight years later, at 16 years old, his heart began to seek the Lord. And four years after that, at 20 years old, 12th year of his reign, the Bible says that he began to restore the ways of Israel, including number one, though, he took care of the land. Now, here's what he did. He sent people out and he took down the groves, they're often called. They were places where they planted trees and shrubbery where it would be shady, where they could go in there and worship their gods. He said they said he took down the high places, those high places where they'd plant the groves. Go up there because people have thought for years and years and years, millennia, that the higher I get on a physical plane here, somehow I'm closer to deity that's above me. And, and uh, even a, a casual reading of the Bible, we can see that's proven false. Nothing wrong if you build a, a church building on a hilltop. People do that sometimes. But the point is this, that what they were doing was, was worshiping outside of God's will. They were doing what they wanted to do and no longer listening to God. Now, here's what takes place. Jo Josiah takes care of all these things. He has these things taken down. He has the bones of priests, false priests, dug up that had their children offered up into idol gods, murdered then, in other words, and sacrificed to those gods. Has them dug up and burned. Josiah kind of meant business, didn't he? And he starts, he starts getting out. Hilkiah and Shaphan and these other guys going in. And they're starting to go in. And they have to go into the house of God, which is the temple by this time. Go in the temple and they have to clean it out. Which is going to tell us a lot about what's been going on in these days, right? There's filth. There's things knocked over. There's things destroyed. It's a mess in there. They're cleaning these things out. They're collecting monies to go out and fix this. There's a full reformation and a restoration going on in Judah and in particular in Jerusalem, God's holy city in that day. And Hilkiah the priest stumbles across a great find in there. He's looking around in there and the Bible says, especially in the, in the account there in 2 Chronicles, said he comes out and he says, Aha! I have found the book of the law of God in my back seat. Wait a minute. I have found the book of the law of God on the coffee table. I have found the book of the law of God, listen to what he says, in the house of the Lord. Ain't that too funny? What's that doing in there? <laughs> what is God's book doing in the house of God? No wonder we couldn't find it. <laughs> we had to clean it up. Now, folks, look at the deplorable condition, spiritually and otherwise, of Judah. That they didn't even know it was in there. That comes out, they take it to hold of the prophetess. She looks in and says, hey, well, no wonder you can't even, you've not even been observing all the festivals of God. Snap. Thought something felt a little bit off. 
And the next thing you know, they're observing festivals of God. Josiah is mourning, declares mourning for the people. There's wailing. There's all these things are going on because, wait just a moment, we didn't have the book of God. You know what that means? We didn't have a clue what we were doing. You know what happens today when we lose the book of God? Be it in our hearts, in our minds, our souls, or on our shelf. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have a clue. When God's book isn't at the very premiere, at the front of all the people who go by His name, whether right or wrong, especially, but especially wrong, when they don't do what God says in that book and they're not looking into God's book, reading what it says, understanding the message is given to them, knowing how to worship, knowing how to be saved from our sins, knowing how to live the life of God, and knowing how to get to heaven. People start making it up as they go along, and they do. I have heard people start espousing doctrines and talking about it, and people in other rooms say, yeah, that's right, and they go on about it, and there's not a hint of it in all of the sacred Scripture of God. But when you get away from God's book, folks, you talk about lost. And sometimes we lose it even though it's right in front of us. They lost it in the house of God. Folks, that, would, that embarrasses me now <laughs> to think about that, especially as a king. But thank goodness for King Josiah, though, right? He was certainly on the right path. He took care of things. He made things right. But they found God's book. And they made sure that they could commit that to their heart and to their mind and to their souls. And that's exactly what it does. Because you know what the book of God does? It touches our heart, mind, and soul. It gets deep into the, the thoughts of, of God. It shares those thoughts with us that we can then understand and know what is right to do. And those folks, the reason they were so far off of the beaten path where they should have been is because they lost it. And also we understand they didn't even go into the house of God anymore, which means the priesthood was a wreck, which means worship was a wreck, which means the entire state of Judah and Jerusalem was as well. Don't think that we can't do the same thing. Just because our building is not trashed, just because the Word of God is readily available to us, folks, we could still lose it under our spiritual noses. We could still not pay attention to it and not realize the things that God has planned for us to do. <clears throat> now, there's a restoration of it the Bible speaks about too, and I like to see these things, especially in Nehemiah. We're looking at a time of post-captivity, Babylonian captivity, the folks that not long after what we just talked about there in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, when they fell away, eventually they fell away so much so that God sent the Babylonian army to take them away. And they'd forgotten. And one of the things that Ezekiel, especially Ezekiel, and Jeremiah and Daniel all prophesied during that same time in three different places, what they tried to do, restore the law of God. Because if I don't know I'm doing wrong, I'm not going to change from doing wrong, am I? I'm going to keep living, 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 living in that same way. Now here's what takes place here. When you have Nehemiah, or during the book of Nehemiah, you have Ezra, who was, the Bible says in Ezra 7, verse 10, a ready scribe before God. That he was a scribe and he was a priest. And once they come back to Jerusalem, they've got some things to restore. But it's not right away the grandeur of the temple or that sort of thing. One of the first things they have to restore is the Word of God, the law of God. They've been away in captivity. Many of these folks were born and raised in captivity in Babylonia, haven't seen Jerusalem before this time. And one thing, they, they build this, the Bible calls it a pulpit of wood. They stand up there and there's about eight or nine together working. But we have Ezra number one. It's kind of a Pentecost kind of day. You've got several folks up there, and you've got kind of a lead speaker. And you have Ezra up there. And the Bible says that Ezra, once everybody was gathered, all the scribes and all the priests were doing their jobs, all the people were out here, and they were standing up, listening to what they had to say, because he was reading to them the law. He wanted them to hear and to understand. Because when he stood up to read, he read from them what the Word of God said. Now, whether or not they had lost their Hebrew language or not, and it was an Aramaic, and he was trying to bring it across, I don't know. All I know is, is this, that he read from the Word of God, and they heard the Word of God, the Bible says distinctly or very clearly. And the Bible says they also, in verse 8 there, that he caused them to understand 
the reading. You remember when Philip was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch? Do you understand what you read? Well, here in Nehemiah, it's the same thing. I want you to hear, to listen, to read these things I'm reading to you, and to understand them. And they stood upon their feet until noon to listen to the Word of God. Folks, there's reverence. There's an understanding. I know congregations today that still, when they have the Scripture reading before the sermon, everybody stands. Well, you don't have to, but I think that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting and uh, shows maybe a little more reverence. That they stand when the Word of God is read, that everyone is seated afterward. I've always liked that. And that's what is going on here. These people are being restored. They are happy. They, the Word of God has been found yet again. Ezra, Nehemiah, and others are making sure that Word of God is restored. Amos predicted there in Amos chapter before Nehemiah's time, there would be a famine in the land. He said, not a famine of food and of water, but of hearing the words of God. And now, folks, that's the greatest famine we can ever see. There will be a time when God, I think he's looking at the time that we call, well, that is often called silent, but it's anything but silent. Uh, those 400 or so years between the Old and the New Testament, Matthew 1 beginning, the events in Matthew 1 beginning. But those times where God wasn't speaking directly to the prophets any longer, that they're waiting for the time of the Messiah. He said there's going to be a time where people are going to be hungry. There's going to be a famine. There's going to be a time when they don't want to hear what God says. And you read through secular history during that time, and there were a lot of people who were starving to death spiritually when God's Word was still readily available. As a matter of fact, between those years of the end of the Old Covenant to the beginning of the New, or the birth of Jesus anyway, there were translations and copies of the, of the Old Testament coming out pretty regular. Not like we do today, of course, but quite a bit. The Bible was there, but people made it a famine. And unfortunately, sometimes even today, people still make it a famine as well. And let's close with these thoughts. When we look at God's Word, we look at that marvelous book that God has given to us, what do we see? I've said it before that sometimes when we look into that mirror image, that's why we want to close it back up. Just like we sometimes we struggle and stumble in the bathrooms in the mornings, look in that bathroom mirror and go, ah. <laughs> Turn the light back off. I think I'll just make do today. Right? I'm not the only one that does that, right? Ugh, look at that guy in the mirror. We well, you know what the Bible says, that that's exactly what the book is. That, and only an inspired book of God can do that, folks. Only an inspired book of God can make us, when we open it up, we can see. We see what we're supposed to see. What we're supposed to look like. He says it's like the person that goes and looks in the mirror and he turns away and said immediately forgets what person he is. That's why he said previously, be doers of the word and not hearers only. There's a difference, isn't there? You know, people can give us instructions and we can hear those instructions on the job or whatever it may be. But if we don't do them, you know what happens? We get in trouble. We get chewed out. We get fired. We get whatever else it may be. Why didn't you do what I told you? Well, I listened. Isn't that good enough? But you didn't do what I said? Yeah, but I listened. I mean, come on. Give me a break. Cut me some slack. Is that the way God has always worked with people? That just, you know, well, you heard and that's good enough. Good job, Adam and Eve. Just keep eating the fruit, it's okay. But there was an immediate rebuke for not doing what they were supposed to do. When we look into the mirror image of God, you go back to verse 21, especially of James chapter 1, and one thing that Christians, we, that's who he's writing to, the 12 tribes of the dispersion, James 1 and verse 1, one thing that we do as we look into the Bible is we understand that what God has written there, but he says we're supposed to put apart all kinds of wickedness, an abundance of evil, all however various ways it's translated. Put those things away, and we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Please notice something in what he says about the word of God there. 
Uh, I know the New King James and the Old King James likes this, really fond of that word, engrafted. Uh, the idea is a melding into the system, of a welding in almost, of taking two, what, two different things and making them become one. And that's exactly how the Bible looks at that with that mirror image there. There's a reason why we, see, we should see what God, God expects of us and how we're supposed to look in God's eyes because we have been melded together with it. Well, I read the Bible, but I still don't, and I still don't match what God says. Well, you better read it again. <laughs> I think you're reading it with blinders on or reading some Reader's Digest version or something like that that doesn't give you any kind of what God says. What I want to do is read what God says and it becomes engrafted. It's part of me. And the answers that we give to people and the answers that we give to our own conscience, that doubts, that looks in different directions, comes directly from God because we have it engrafted in part of us. It's there. And it should flow, the Scripture should flow out of God's people as readily as anything in this world does. We may not say book, chapter, and verse right then, and that's okay. Book, chapter, and verse are not inspired, by the way. They were added by a man about, about 400 years ago, five, 450 years ago, a man added those in there. So, and I like them. It sure makes it easy to look stuff up, doesn't it? But here's the thing. If I know what the Bible says, if I get the wrong book, chapter, and verse, but I've still said what God says, I've still said what God says. Right? I still know what God says. I still said those things. And it works. It does the purpose that God has sent it to do. Because that's the way God wants it to work with us. I think of that last one there in Acts 17 11. Let's close with that. That when <clears throat> Paul and the others were traveling throughout the countryside and they were going to all these different locations and they were teaching the gospel, Paul often went into the synagogues and while he was in these synagogues, he would teach to the Jewish audiences. Chapter, or verse, or chapter 17 begins that way, as a matter of fact. That he would go to these different places. And now he is here in Berea. And he's in Berea and he starts talking. And he's given the same thing that he's always given about how the scriptures prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he was, died for, died, was buried for three days and was raised to walk in newness of life. He gave the gospel. And folks would start believing. And I love how these, it, the older versions translated this way, that the, noble, the Bereans were more, these were more noble than those of Thessalonica. That's an interesting word. Noble. That's literally the word in the Greek language can be translated as noble. And a higher standard. Okay, do you get it? God says these people, these Bereans, were a higher standard than other people, those in Thessalonica in particular. Thessalonica, all they did was want to start lies and run people out of town. Welcome to Christianity, boys. But he says these are more noble than those in Thessalonica. But why, Paul? Because they searched the Scriptures, now listen to what he says, daily to see whether those things were so. The, the, the root of that the, uh, idea and those language there. We come across in English in a most literal way as one who's researching diligently like for a court of law. That's how hard they're studying to win their case. That's the meaning of it. To win their case, they're going to do whatever it takes. So they diligently reached in there. That's why they're noble. Because they look and see what God says about the matter. And can we ask for anything more than that? That someone can be that noble that they can look and see what the Bible says. I, I love that. I like it when people question me. When people say, well, you know, the Bible says this. Well, what about this? Hey, amen and hallelujah and praise all of you. You're actually reading the Bible. Go right ahead. You're not going to, well, you can't offend me, but you're not going to offend me by that. By saying what the Bible says or asking about something over here. It's okay. I've been wrong a bunch. I know the feeling quite well. Right? But the Bible isn't. And the last thing I want to do is make the Bible look wrong, don't you? The Bible's always right. Guess who can always be wrong? But you too, by the way, not just me. All of you, because the Bible teaches us so. Folks, when we look at God's holy book, and we reach out there, we pick that thing up, even when we pick it up and carry it around, shouldn't we do it with some bit of reverence? because of the words that it contains. 
and I'm not saying in a superstitious manner we put it in the ark and carry it on Levites back and that sort of thing like they did the old covenant. But they're still there. But most of all, I want to impress on us today, let's carry it in our hearts. Let's put it in our heart and carry it in the best place it can be carried. And put it in our heart and put it in our mind. Put it in that ready place, that ready, readily available place. When well, we need it, folks, God's always got the answer for us. And if I don't, then I can reach over and pick it up and find it anyway. It's going to answer critics. It's going to answer the, the unbeliever. It's going to answer the skeptics. It's going to answer anybody. They're not going to like it. But folks, listen, God's still right. And man is still wrong. Don't believe me? Read Romans chapter 2. Matter of fact, read generation, Genesis to Revelation. Uh, it's all in there. I can assure you. I challenge you to read it. Because that's what God teaches us. Folks, we're here today. We're not a child of God. I want to ask you on God's behalf that you become one. That you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ as Paul went into the Jewish audiences of his day and talked to audiences who weren't Jewish one thing he, the thing he always brought up was that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And how that is the foundation of Christianity. And when I believe in those things, understand those things, and understand why he did it. He did it for me. He did it for anyone else in this world to save their soul. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, folks. But if you're here and you haven't, as Paul often says, obeyed that gospel, that is, replicated it. The Bible says you can the Bible says you should. And when you do that, you're a child of God. You have been immersed into water. You have been forgiven of your sins. You are washed clean and pure on the inside, that part that really matters. And we're walking hand in hand with God. If you have done that and fallen away, we don't want you to be there any more than God does. Why don't you come now while we stand and while we sing? <sighs>